What may have been the city's first child care center was opened in 1878 by the Sisters of the Holy Family, an order that originated in San Francisco itself. The idea was brought to them by a priest who was worried about the growing number of children left on their own while their parents worked. Father Prendergast was walking along through a very poor part of San Francisco one time, and this, uh, I think he was with the Archbishop, and this little fellow was crawling out a window, a basement window, onto the sidewalk. And uh, Father stopped to ask him what he was doing, and the little guy and his brother had climbed up on the stove that was in the, in the little basement apartment and had climbed out the window. Their mother and father, when they went to work, locked the children in. He was very concerned with children who had no one to care for them. So when the Archbishop suggested that um, perhaps this new community could figure out how to, how to care for some of these children, um, Father Prendergast thought that this, this might work. The sisters opened the doors of their own home for young children whose parents were working. Their day homes expanded into other neighborhoods and were widely supported by philanthropic San Franciscans. These pioneering orders would be joined by more than 30 additional orders of religious women, including four cloistered orders. In addition, by the time the archdiocese marked its centennial, 11 communities of men religious and three communities of brothers were also serving the people of the Archdiocese of San Francisco. In 1884, Patrick Reardon became the second Archbishop of San Francisco and would place his own special stamp on the region for the next 30 years. His first task was to fulfill his predecessor's dream of a new and larger cathedral. Alemany had purchased land but left the fundraising and construction to his successor. The new cathedral was completed and dedicated as St. Mary of the Assumption in January 1891 after five years of construction. The large red brick structure would be a landmark at Van Ness and O'Farrell Streets for the next seven decades. As San Francisco and Northern California continued to grow in population, the Archdiocese established dozens of new parishes staffed by diocesan priests, many from Ireland, and priests of religious orders such as the Dominicans and Jesuits. Reardon's long-held dream of establishing a seminary in the Archdiocese came to fruition when St. Patrick's Seminary was opened in 1898. By the early 1900s, San Francisco was becoming a very Catholic city, thanks to a steady influx of immigrants from around the world, most notably from Ireland, Italy, and Germany. 34% of the city's population was now Catholic, these working-class immigrants found a great defender in the church in Father Peter C. York from Galway, Ireland. York placed the church in San Francisco firmly on the side of labor during the Teamsters' strike of 1901. Though the strike turned bloody and brutal, five workers were killed and hundreds injured, York rallied workers with electrifying speeches. Shall men for whom Christ died to teach them that they were free men with free men's rights be crushed beneath the foot of the least bright of all the angels that fell from heaven, mammon, the spirit of greed? The church held on to its working people, and it held on to its working people in significant part because of priests like Peter York, who identified with them, identified with ordinary men and women, the struggles for hardship, and, and helped organize those parishes. You look at a church like St. Paul's in the Mission, that gorgeous, beautiful Gothic structure, or, or St. Peter's in the Petrero, these were built, these churches were built from the contributions of working people who love their church, for whom the parish, the parish school, the parish social hall, the parish welfare programs became a great buffer for them uh, as they negotiated, in many cases first generation Americans, uh, many from Ireland, as they negotiated their new environment. On the morning of April 18, 1906, San Franciscans woke to a terrible jolt, an earthquake now estimated to be 8.4 on the Richter scale. Fires raged in the city, hundreds lost their lives, and a quarter of a million people were left homeless. Well, the uh, earthquake, of course, devastated the southern part of the city, and uh, all the south of Market District got wiped out. We had about 14 churches that were completely destroyed and many, many other institutions that were damaged. Archbishop Reardon decided that to keep the morale up, he had to come back and say, we're building everything again. And so within two years, every church that had been destroyed had a church that was operating. It was a temporary structure. 
And then within another eight years, every church that had been destroyed had been rebuilt in a major fashion, some very impressive buildings. Edward J. Hanna succeeded Reardon as Archbishop of San Francisco in 1915, the year of the Panama Pacific Exhibition, an event celebrating the rebuilding and resurgence of San Francisco. During his 20-year tenure as Archbishop, Hanna would play a prominent role in public affairs on the local, state, and national levels. In the Great Depression, he was chairman of the California Committee of the Unemployed, and Hanna's status reflected the importance of the Catholic Church in the life of San Francisco. Archbishop Edward Hanna, who was our Archbishop from 1914 to about 1935, when he retired and went to Rome, was a powerful and committed social activist. In fact, he was honored by the University of California for his social activism. He was called in constantly to intervene in strikes, to mediate strikes. He was called to look into the cotton strike in 1933, and uh, he ministered to the prisoners in San Quentin, etc. So I think that tradition of reaching out uh, be begins really with the, uh, in the 1930s with the extraordinary career of Archbishop uh, Hanna. The early 1920s witnessed the revival of the Ku Klux Klan, which expanded its hatred to Catholics, Jews, and immigrants, as well as African Americans. In 1924, the nation's capital saw a large KKK march down Pennsylvania Avenue. Catholics resolved to counter the Klan with rallies of their own, including one in San Francisco. Now, in 1924 in San Francisco, ostensibly this was because Archbishop Hanna was coming back from Rome, but everybody knew what it was about, that we were making a statement Again, we are here, we're not going to let the Ku Klux Klan intimidate us, and we're going to show the power of Catholicism in the city of San Francisco. Not so much the power, but the, the presence of it. And uh, so close to 80,000 people marched down Market Street on a rainy day and then celebrated Mass uh, outside the City Hall in San Francisco with uh, Archbishop uh, Hanna and the mayor present. So it was a very impressive event. World War II transformed the entire Bay Area. Hundreds of thousands of people flooded the area to work in war industries or returned here to settle down after the war. The post-war boom was particularly evident in the Archdiocese of San Francisco, which saw one of the largest expansions in the history of the local church. At the time, the Archdiocese was made up of 13 counties, stretching from Santa Clara north to the Oregon border. Between 1935 and 1961, the population of the Archdiocese nearly tripled from 400,000 to 1.2 million. To meet the needs of a growing Catholic population, the Archdiocese added 84 new parishes, 13 new high schools, and scores of elementary schools. Finally, in 1962, the Archdiocese was divided and the new dioceses of Oakland, Santa Rosa, and Stockton were created. But amidst the prosperity of the time, a priest named Father Alfred Bodeker noticed that there was an increasing number of transient and destitute people near his downtown church, St. Boniface. Father Alfred said in a prayer to St. Anthony, if you get me a place, I will feed them. And Father Alfred had a tremendous vision, and he also had a tremendous practicality, organization within his mind. And you could tell his motives were he wanted to help. What could he do in this situation? So he was observant and a visionary and organized. And those qualities came together uh, when he realized there was a need of feeding the hungry. An unused garage on Jones Street on the side of St. Boniface was open and he got that. And most of the uh, uh, unions helped him you know, the painters, the electricians, and all those to make it so. Uh, and then he went around, there were a lot of produce people around the Embarcadero. And Alfred could speak different languages. He was good in Italian. He studied in Italy. And he would talk Italian to some of them. And he gathered up the food. But Al Father Alfred always told me that the best promoter we have for St. Anthony's is St. Anthony himself. And he would say, God inspires these people to give. 